Last week, in uh, an examination of uh, some first principles, as I'm trying to do here and there, well, we talked quite a bit about the love of God, and we mostly spoke about it uh, in terms of God's perspective, God's love, or um, within Himself, of course, the love that exists between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and also talked quite a bit about God's love for us, how God's great thing that He desires to do uh, from the beginning is to bring us into this relationship with Himself. Um, the love of God, of course, is manifested in the very emphatic statement of John in 1 John chapter 4, uh, where John says it twice, actually, in verse 8, that the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. And again in verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. God is love, the text says. Which you know, really is, means that when, whenever the Bible says something that strongly, that God is love, it means that the love of God is something that is extremely fundamental to the faith. It is a foundation. It is a building block. It is not something that you, you know, just happen to casually talk about in week 12 of a first converts course. It is something that ought to be there from the beginning, stressed and emphasized uh, to a point of, you know, that this is the very foundation of our faith. If God is not love, then indeed, what is all of this for? And the scripture, of course, uses the love of God as the basis of the gospel, the proclamation of the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was buried and was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is, of course, the meaning of John chapter 3 and verse 16, that passage so often used to sum up the gospel. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And we might think also of uh, when in John chapter 15, when Jesus spoke of the highest possible standard of love. And in John chapter 15, he said that greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And we think of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where it talks, uh, in verses 3... I'm sorry, I'm getting the verse numbers wrong. I should just turn and look at it. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verses 4 and 5, where it says that in love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. So, we look at that, of course, that God, God's relationship, His love is perfect. This father-son relationship has no flaws in it. And yet, in spite of the fact that God has everything He could possibly want, could possibly need, could possibly desire, He chooses to create us, He chooses to save us, He chooses to redeem us, He chooses to adopt us as sons also, because of His great love for us. You see, God, the Father in heaven, loves His Son, but He also loves us and wants to make us His sons as well. And he does this in spite of the fact that we're not that great a people. You know, I mentioned John 15 last time, and a little bit this time, that, you know, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. But what if you're not friends? What if you're laying down your life for your enemies? I mean, who does that? Do you know anyone who does that? Personally, that's a hard thing to see. And yet, we see that very thing in the gospel. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes this. Uh, go to Romans chapter 5 and pick up in verse 6 and see what Paul says here about the very depth of God's love for us. That while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man. Well, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love towards us that while in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. 
or if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You see what it says there? Especially in verse 10. It doesn't say that we were his friends and he died for us. It said that while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. God gives up his son in spite of the fact that we are enemies to him. That we are people who have demonstrated nothing but contempt and hatred for him. But God loved the world, the world that rejects his son, that has rejected every prophet that has ever come to them, that has rejected the very words of God since the foundation of the world, failing to honor him as God, failing to give him thanks. From then until now, God loved that world and gave his son to die for that world so that he might adopt some of them as sons, so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's the message of the gospel right there. And that is the depth and the extent to which God's love goes. A love greater than the love that Jesus said no man could have greater love than. Jesus said greater love has no man than this. But God has a greater love still in that he died for his enemies. And it is an indestructible love. And as a result of that, of course, when God asks us to love him in return, it's not like, oh, you know, the God has some kind of you know, big self-esteem issue or acceptance issue, like, oh, I've just got to be accepted by other people or I can't feel good about myself. If, you, if that's what you think about God, you have completely the wrong idea of the situation. You don't... You know what God gets out of it if you love Him? God doesn't really get anything out of it. You know what God loses if you don't love Him? He doesn't really lose anything. As Elihu says, if you sin, what do you accomplish against Him? But God wants us to love Him anyway. And that is the, the, the thing that we need to understand so emphatically is that God extends this offer of love to us despite not having a need for it, and despite us not, not having des any real deserving qualities of it. That's the definition of grace right there. You know, we talk about unmerited favor. Well... I mean, what favor is greater than the love of God being bestowed on us? And what less merit can anyone have than the merit which we have for it? What, how much less can we possibly deserve the love of God? I mean, we're enemies. No one dies for their enemies. And yet, we see that in Christ. And so when God says what he says in his commandments, that we ought to love him, that we ought to love one another... He's established that he has a pretty reasonable foundation for claiming such things. We looked at this passage last time too. But I want to look at it again, and this time from the other side. Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, uh, Jesus is having kind of his own little question and answer session. Uh, but one of the scribes, in verse 28 of Mark chapter 12, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, what commandment is foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Does God have the right to ask that? Well, He certainly loves us quite a bit. And that's the, that's the, uh, the extended offer. Since God has already shown His love for us, He asks that we reciprocate that love by loving Him. He's been asking that since the beginning. But Jesus goes on. He's not done. Verse 31, the second, the second commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. To love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. And the scribe makes this point here, that there is something that is greater than burnt offerings and sacrifices. There is something that is greater than simply checking off the list of things that you have to do in your worship. And that thing that is greater is the love that we're supposed to have for God, and the love that we're supposed to have for our neighbor. 
And it is, I, I say this right now, it is possible to come into an assembly like this one and to worship every week, to do all of the things, quote-unquote, prescribed regarding singing and praying and the Lord's Supper and whatever, to do all of those things and to not have love for the Lord. And do you know what that worship gains you if you don't love the Lord? It profits you nothing. And you know what that worship gains you if you don't have love for your brethren? Again, it profits you nothing. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Oh, he, spoke, he speaks of this quite emphatically. By the way, the surrounding context of 1 Corinthians 13 is about you know, what they're doing in worship assemblies. And what does Paul say? He says, if I speak the languages of men and angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all knowledge, and I have all faith, so as to move mountains, which that sounds pretty cool, but I do not have love. I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. You know. Oh, by the way, yeah, that's kind of interesting too. Giving all your money is not the same thing as love. You can give all your possessions and not actually be a loving person. Those two don't go necessarily hand in hand. You can write a really, really big check, but that's not the same thing as love. If we don't have love for God, for our neighbor, what good is the rest of it? That's why this is foundational. That's why this is a first principle. Not having love for your brethren may very well keep people out of heaven. And that's the great struggle. We talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, of course. That comes from the law comes from Leviticus, which uh, in Leviticus chapter 19. In Leviticus chapter 19, uh, there's a long list of things that you're not supposed to do. You shall not steal. Uh, in verse 11, you shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse a deaf man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall revere your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's such a... Yeah, I think that sometimes people read that the wrong way. You know, they read, they read the as yourself part and they think about, oh, no, there you go, implicit commandment for self-love. I don't think humanity has a problem with that part. There's a lot of people who think they have a problem with self-love because they want to love themselves more. But you know, humanity is generally very good at loving themselves. Uh, and, you know, we look at that. The point here isn't you need to love yourself. The point is you already figured out how to do that. Learn how to transfer some of that love that you have for yourself onto other people. Learn, learn how to translate some of that you know, self-interest that you're so invested in onto other people. And that's the basic idea that's being put forth here. We're very good at forgiving ourselves, for instance. We're very good at holding ourselves to different standards than everybody else. You know, if I get angry at somebody and snap at them and blow up at them, it's because I'm having a bad day and there's some kind of implicit justification for my actions. You know, but if the clerk at the drive-thru blows up at me and gets mad at me, it's not because of they're having a bad day, it's because they're an inherently bad person. We see the double standard, right? I can't think of people that way. That's not how I'm supposed to treat my neighbor. I should be willing to forbear the faults in others that I'm willing to forbear in myself. I should be willing to forgive in others what I'm willing to forgive in myself. I should be willing to put up with in others what I put up with in myself every day. Now that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard standard to meet. But that's what Jesus was saying too. When he talks about, you know, when, when Jesus gave that whole discourse about don't judge so that you won't be judged, he's not 
what, what he's not saying is that you can't ever tell somebody they're wrong. That's not the point of that. The point of that is that you don't criticize people for faults that you yourself have like you don't have a problem with it. Don't try to remove the little speck out of somebody's eye when you got this giant blank, giant two by four coming out of your own eye, making a mess of the whole thing. Or as Matthew 7, 12 puts it, in all things, treat other people the way you want to be treated. This is the law and the prophets. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, of course, humans are very clever at getting out of stuff, at reading things, and twisting things, and making them not mean what they say. And so, of course, naturally, the question that I think any Israelite would have asked, oh, love your neighbor as yourself, that doesn't apply to people who aren't my neighbor, right? Who is my neighbor? Well, the lawyer asked that in Luke 10. And, you know, they might have been tempted, well, neighbor means fellow Jews. So I don't have to treat the, I don't have to love the Gentiles as myself, right? Wrong. In fact, I mean, it's, we know it's wrong, but I don't think they read Leviticus back then either. In Leviticus 19 and verse 34, what's it say? Well, in verses 33 and 34, when a stranger resides in your land, with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you. You shall love him as yourself, for you were given, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. Huh, imagine that. Strangers being loved as yourself as well. Foreigners being loved as yourself as well. Something to think about. And then, of course, we have Jesus' statement in John 13, which really hammers the standard. In John 13, in verse 34, Jesus tells his disciples, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now Jesus calls that a new commandment, and you know, we just read the passage about loving your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus doesn't say, love one another as yourself. He says, love one another as I have loved you. And when you look at the standard that Jesus sets for love, how he dies on the cross for, for the sins of these people, how he's willing to endure shame and suffering for people that are his enemies, that should tell you something about the as I have loved you part. Are there any exceptions? Are there any things that we should not be willing to do? Well, that's the real... Is there any depth of sacrifice and lengths to which we should not go to bring people to the Lord, to show our love for them? No human on the face of the earth meets this standard as Christ has loved us. All people try, certainly. And as we strive to do that, then there's the other side of the coin, which is if you want to be a disciple of Christ and you want people to know you as disciples of Christ, they're going to know it by your love for one another. Love for the brethren is a command. We need to take the commands of God super seriously. A lot of brethren, they pride themselves on taking uh, commands of God super seriously. You know, we take baptism really seriously because that's important. And it is. We take the Lord's Supper very seriously. We take the Bible's rulings about marriage and divorce very seriously because those are commands. Do we take the same kind of seriousness when it comes to this commandment to love one another? If you don't love your brethren, you're not a real Christian. In 1 John chapter 3, and I can, I can say that because that's what the scripture says. In 1 John chapter 3, in verse 10, it says that by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. But this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. For what reason did he slay, them? slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. What's the difference between a person who is a child of Satan and a person who is a child of God? Their love for one another. So when I say you can't be a real Christian unless you love your brethren, it comes straight out of the scripture there. That makes the children of God and the children of the devil obvious. That needs to be the standard that we strive for. Not doing this will keep you out of heaven. 
And that would be a really bad reason to not go to heaven. In fact, there are three places in the scripture where love your neighbor as yourself is quoted as the, the summation of the law. And the writer doesn't even bother to mention love for God. That's what I think is interesting. Uh, it's in Galatians 5, in Romans 13, and in James 2. Both James and Paul said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the fulfillment of the law right there. Don't even bother to quote the love your, the Lord your God with all your heart. Why don't they quote that? Is it because they didn't think loving God was important? No. It's because they're so intricately tied that there's no need to quote it. People's prob Religious people's problem isn't loving God. It's, at least they don't think it's loving God. It's loving the brethren. That's where the struggle is. That's where the concrete problem is. It's very easy to love a God whom you don't see. And to say, oh, well, I don't, really, I don't really see him. He hasn't really had any major interactions. So I can just sort of believe in God as an abstract concept and have love for that abstract concept. But when it comes time to meet my flesh and blood brother who mistreats me, who says bad things about me, and who I just don't like very much, well, I mean, the Lord's asking too much to ask me to love him. Excuse me? And again, I'm not out of my mind here. This is the thing that the scriptures put forth. In 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Yeah. Right there. It isn't, God, God didn't you know, say, well, I'll love you if you love me first. That's not what happened. He loved us first, and we love in response. We reciprocate. But he goes on, verse 20. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment which we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So, there might be people who claim to love God and don't really love their brethren, but there are no, there, there, there are no people who genuinely are able to separate the two because the two are not separable. You either love your brother... Your flesh and blood brother in Christ who is there, who is here right now, who you have to do things for and you have to have a relationship with or you don't love the Lord. And that, that can be scary. Sometimes I look at myself and it's, sometimes it's hard to love your brethren. Sometimes your brethren mistreat you. Sometimes your brethren you know, hurt your feelings. Sometimes they say things that just don't make sense. I can tell you right now, I struggle with it. But you know what? Christ died for me. And I'm pretty unlovable. I was an enemy. I was reconciled to him. And if Christ could reconcile enemies to God by his death, then what the Lord is asking of me doesn't look so great by comparison doesn't look so insurmountable. Love one another as I have loved you, he says. The other comment in verse 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And the logically demanded contrapositive of that is that if, the, if all men do not know you are his disciples, then you don't actually love one another. That ought to scare us too. Do all men know that we are his disciples? I believe in an all-powerful God who is able to do whatever he says. And, you know, he can create a standard, a way of showing these people are the real Christians, these people aren't. Here's how you can tell. And you know what the standard of discipleship is? Love for one another. Now, some people speak as if the standard, the mark of discipleship that you can tell people about is, um... You know, whether or not you eat the Lord's Supper on Sunday. That's the mark of discipleship. The Bible doesn't say that's the mark of discipleship. The Bible says love for one another is the mark of discipleship. Oh, uh, well, if you attend a church with the words Church of Christ on the sign, that's not the mark of discipleship. The mark of discipleship is love for one another. Um, well, you know, I mean, and, and on and on. People come up with a thousand different marks of discipleship, whether or not you use instruments or whether or not you, uh, you know, can take, take the correct view on such and such controversy over here. Love for one another is the mark of discipleship. 
Did he stutter? No. Regardless of whether we are, I mean, you know, we, we can talk about those other issues and certainly not like God doesn't care about, you know, being right and preaching the truth and all these different things. But how are people supposed to identify us? Our evangelistic appeal, our outreach to the entire world needs to start with the fact that the family of God has this one another relationship that transcends everything else. The fact that we have been united by the blood of Christ ought to be the thing that holds us together. And the rest of the world ought to be able to look at us and say, you know, love them or hate them, those people are disciples of Christ. That's how people identify us. And if we're not making the point strongly enough, then it's time to look inward and see what we can do to change that. Otherwise, we're just keeping house. We're just practicing empty rituals. The rest of it doesn't matter. That's what the love of God is about. There are, of course, a bunch of practical things that we could say. We need to spend time getting to know our brethren, certainly. That seems to go without saying. You know, I mean, when the final amen is said and the assembly of worship is ended, is our first instinct to bolt for the door? Because, you know, otherwise we might have to talk to somebody. That love for your brethren? Is our first instinct, whenever we hear of a brother in need, say, well, I don't know, I mean, you know, do they really deserve this help here? And to be stingy with resources at one's disposal, is that our first instinct? When we talk about hospitality, having people into our homes, allowing people to share in our private lives, do we do that? When we talk about those who are sick, or shut in, or depressed, or downtrodden, those who are widows, those who are orphans, how do we stand up when it comes to loving one another? Do we do what Romans 12.15 says? When the scripture says to rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. I tell you, the body of Christ ought to be so knit together that when one of us is suffering, everybody else is suffering too. And when one of us is rejoicing, everybody else is rejoicing too. And if the, you know, if the central nervous system is shutting down and the communication between the members is not working right, that needs to change. That needs to be addressed. And what about when we have conflicts with one another? When one brother sins against another. And that happens. That happens all the time. How is it handled, though, is the question. Nobody's perfect. But how do we handle it when we mess up? Do we gossip about the other person? Do we complain about them every step of the way? Do we complain and talk to every person except the person whom we have a problem with? That's not love for one another. That's not the work of God. That's the work of the devil. That's how he destroys churches destroys friendships, destroys relationships. You know, we just saying angry words, oh, let them never. And we talk about, you know, I mean, you might be talking about outbursts in conversation, but you know what else is an angry word that can destroy relationships? When somebody sins against a brother and they talk about it to everybody else but the person who actually ha had the problem. The love of God does not live in the person that does that. Reconciliation. Jesus thought it was so important that when he offered the choice between worshiping God and reconciling with your brother, what does Jesus tell you to do? Look at Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Which is more important? Worship? Or making sure that your relationships with your brethren are right? They're both important. Which one does Jesus say you do first? That's what he's got to say there in Matthew 5. There's a number of other points I'm sure we could make. And I'm 
preaching to myself because I feel like I have so many ways in which I need to grow in this and which I still have fall short in my love for others, my love for my brethren, my love for people I meet on a regular basis. But you know what? That's why we're here. To help each other grow. And if we're here this morning and your relationship with the Lord is not what it ought to be, your love for God well, needs to be realized in a more profound way. Perhaps you need to make yourself right with the Lord. Perhaps you need to be immersed into Christ for the first time. Perhaps, uh, for whatever reason, you've wandered off and you need to make your life right yet again. One of the ways we show love for one another is by showing kindness when the brother is restored. Like a prodigal son coming home, we ought to celebrate with people when they've come back to Christ. And if there's anyone here this morning who needs to make their life right with the Lord, now is an appropriate time to let it be known. All together we stand and we sing the song selected.